Okay, welcome again, guys. This topic is on propitiation. Now, when you get into the word propitiation, for a lot of people, it becomes the the sequa noi, the the central point. It becomes the foundation stone of their logic, right? And they see a blood sacrifice substitution. Blood's being used to pay off God. This is how we frame our theology. And um, so what we've done last night, we spoke about the blood and how that works. So we'll just recap that quickly. We're saying Father, Son and Spirit are one, correct? And when God becomes human in Jesus, he takes a dark body and Jesus is still one with Father, Word and Spirit. And we've said that in his body, Jesus has had to beat through the darkness in him. Procopto, he's beaten through the darkness. And who has he found on the other side in him? He's found himself, Dad, and Holy Spirit. And he's been guided by the Holy Spirit with that to come through himself to union. So he's actually fought through. He's fought through and discovered the Word himself, Father, Spirit, holding the whole universe together inside him. He's done that. So when you say the blood of Jesus, you're saying the Father and the Word and the Spirit are one. And on earth, the Spirit, the water and the blood are one. In other words, the Spirit conceived Jesus in the womb. He came by birth, the water, and he's died by blood. So, and that whole thing is held together. And that's held together with Father, Word and Spirit. So you've got the whole thing being held together. So you meet the blood of Jesus, you're meeting a human being who is totally dark and has been totally cleaned up. You're meeting total darkness that's been totally cleaned up, that is joined to Father, Word and Spirit that are one, and that's in the human body. And this blood of the blood is one with Jesus. The blood is one with Father, Word and Spirit. The blood it's the cleaned up darkness of humanity. And when we stuck the spear in his side, out flowed water, which baptized the cosmos. And the water was coming from underneath the temple. You remember in Ezekiel, and it flows out and bigger and bigger. And the blood that flowed is the cleaned up blood of darkness that now baptizes and fills creation. How flippin' good is that? And then Jesus goes and picks up his blood and all of you in it, and all of us in it, and he ascends to the heavenly temple, to the heavenly temple, and he in himself is the meeting place between God and man, and meeting place means propitiation. He's the mercy seat. He's the meeting place in himself, and he has brought all of dark creation back to dad, and dad's pumped about it. Yes, this is really good. Right? So that's how we did it from blood. So we're going to talk, we've just laid out blood and how that works, which is different. Remember, blood is not a magical thing which you can spray around. I'm just going to spray the, the fire hose of blood of Christ around. You know, it's not like that. And um, we're talking about a being, we're not talking about a, a depersonalized blood. So when we talk about propitiation, um, and uh, the word is hilasterion. Um, some people have made the comment that it, this is hilarious, mm. and which is the root of hilarious, hilasterious. And it really, in some ways, is. The gospel is very funny. Um, the way they've flipped darkness, the way they've flipped humanity, it's pretty good. Um, so the meanings for this word include mercy seat, atoning sacrifice, and atoning victim. Now, you can take those words and put them in different frames. So, do you see this in the context of the overarching love story? Or do you frame it within the earthly mosaic tabernacle and the Western concept of separation and paying up to a deity? Or do you see those words in the context of, as we've dis discussed in the previous chat, about I have given these to you, the sacrifice God says, I have given these to you, the blood. It's come down, Leviticus 17, 
I have given these to you, these sacrifices. You don't give them to me. And why have they been given to us in that context? Because we're riddled with guilt. We've got an accuser in our head. And into the fallen mind of Adam was stuck the Mosaic law. And the Mosaic law was to help us get through. And you go, well, but there's two tabernacles in Scripture. There's the heavenly one and the earthly one. Hmm. And the mosaic one is a copy of the heavenly one. Now, the heavenly tabernacle is about this. The heavenly tabernacle is, we're going to have creation and Father, Word and Spirit. We're going to have creation and they're going to be caught up in the middle of us and share our life. Oh, yes, we understand there'll be darkness in creation because we're giving freedom. And yes, the Lamb of God will be slain from the foundation, but we're getting sons and daughters. It's the law of adoption. It's the law of the Spirit. It's the law of life. Okay? So that's the heavenly tabernacle, which is Dad saying, I want what's mine. Now, the earthly tabernacle for us is based around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Wow. That's kicked us back into sin. And God meets us in our darkness in sin. Doesn't stop it. He meets us in our darkness to take us out of it. So God comes down to meet us where we're being accused. And he says, okay, look, you're feeling guilty. You know the law says the wages of sin is death. You know something deserves to die. Take a lamb. Oh, sorry, take a bull, take a goat. They're not lambs. Take a bull, take a goat, kill that instead of yourself. You know the law? And the law is part of the karmic law of the universe. It's part of a very big law. The soul that sins shall die. Darkness is not rewarded. Darkness is, has consequences against it. Now you know you're in that square. Take a bull, take a goat, take a calf, take a goat. And you can kill those instead of yourself. Now, the high priest in that, the high priest had a 4B3 bunch of stones on his chest, which were the 12 tribes of Israel, all different colours. And on his shoulders, he had 12 black stones. And they're all engraved with the names of the tribe of Israel. The black and the colourful. He carried the black stones on his shoulders and he carried coloured stones close to his heart. And he would go into the holy place, most holy place, with the darkness of Israel on his shoulders and the colour of Israel against his heart. Wow. Talk about God saying, this is who you are. You know, you're not, he's saying, you're not pretty. Yeah, you're not pretty yet. So this is pointing forward to Christ. And he also says in Hebrews, it's not possible that blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So what's God given it for? God's given it to us, this for us because we're sitting underneath an accuser. We've eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We have a woodpecker accusing us the whole time in our heads. How do we cope? God gives the sacrifice. I have given these to you for you. They're not going up. God's giving them down. Does this make sense? So, the Mosaic law was given into the depravity of the human race, into our flesh-driven race post-Eden, to prepare us for the coming of Christ and to manage the works of the flesh in the human race. In the flesh, we can sear our conscience, lose an understanding of right and wrong. The Mosaic law was given that every mouth can be stopped, this is from Romans, and all the world may be guilty before God. So you can't, you can't play games with yourself. When we get accused, we've got a couple of options. We split ourselves, but then we end up, we end up saying there's no right and wrong. On, and, and no, God's saying you, you need to face where you are. But this is not to fulfill the pre-creation purpose. The Mosaic law is not fulfilling that you become sons and daughters of God. The Mosaic law is, is a step on the way to sorting out the flesh. Now, in the death of Jesus, 
the veil to the mosaic high place was torn, indicating that the earthly tabernacle and law structure is no longer used. So when Jesus died, the veil was torn between the holy and the most holy place from top to bottom. It's a very heavy curtain. It was torn. And it means that we have access into the most holy place. But it also means that this is not the way we do things anymore. It's the end of that structure. The, the heavenly temple is based around the requirement to get from within creation the sons and daughters of God. And you might notice that in Revelation that the temple is only in the first part of Revelation. When things are finished, you've got the new Jerusalem and there's no more temple there anymore, no more tabernacle. So it's a, it's a step on the way. The Mosaic law could never sort us out. It could never heal the aloneness and mess of Adam. And Paul explains that as the law is preached, behaviour gets worse. Teaching on sin produces more sin. And this is the irony of many religious institutions. Paul also explains that what the Mosaic law could not do, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came into our darkness. He came fully into our darkness. Right? Jesus entered fully into our darkness to sort us out. For what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh. The flesh, the Lord, the, the law is good, but the flesh screws up our ability to use it. God did sit by sending his own son in the likeness of the sinful flesh on account of this corruption, this sin. He condemned <clears throat> sin in the flesh that we might be able to receive love and give love. The righteous requirements. So thank God for doing this. Eternal life is through relationship. This is faith. Eternal life is in Christ. Christ has eternal life in his being. And Christ has it through his relationships with dad. So eternal life is not through the law. Eternal life is through relationships. So faith is receiving a spoken relationships. Now, propitiation means mercy seat. Mercy seat is place of meeting. For the uncreated and the created, so the uncreated tabernacle from that realm and the earthly one, there's a mercy seat. Now, the heavenly tabernacle and the heavenly covenant, which is the new covenant, are based around point two, their pre-creation purpose. So the covenant we're given, the new covenant, is part of the heavenly tabernacle. Christ is going to be in you, leave each other alone, everything's forgiven and forgotten. And that's the tree of life. It's based around the heavenly eternal life. The righteousness of God is from this primary, first or heavenly or original tabernacle. It's the law of adoption, the law of the spirit that we become sons and daughters of God. The blood, the human blood of Jesus Christ is one with the Father, Son and Spirit. It's the blood of the renewed Adam. He's the second Adam. Jesus came into our darkness fully, our flesh fully, and he went to the bottom and saw Dad's face where we couldn't see him. He renewed our flesh. He dealt with flesh and he dealt with the fruit and the context of the flesh. And this blood of renewed humanity in the human Jesus Christ has been poured into creation. It's the blood of the one who holds the universe together. This renewed physical life is poured into creation. It swamps the darkness of creation. And in his ascensions, he picks us up, taking us into the place of union between the uncreated and the created, into the union of the uncreated and the created, which is where Jesus is. And Jesus Christ is the place of union. The risen Jesus is the mercy seat. Oh my goodness. Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. He's our mediator. He's our propitiation. He is fully God, fully man. And there's neither part of God that's fully God, fully man. He is the point of meeting between the creation and the non-created. He has fulfilled both the heavenly and earthly laws and temples. He's the eternal high priest. <clears throat> and as Hebrews says, the heavenly 
supersedes the earthly. So, now we said, let's come back about words. Jesus Christ, therefore, is the atoning victim. He is the victim at our hands. We killed him. He's not a victim of the Father. And in the play of the Father, the eternal Son and Spirit, our killing of Jesus, our violence, in, an, in their non-violent way, completed our healing and our atonement. Talk about pulling the rug. You know, you've got, a, you've got a bunch of rebellious, crazy rabbits over here that all they know is how to kill each other. And you come in, you submit yourself to them violence and you deal with their violence with, in a non-violent way. Staggering. And you not only deal with their violence, you deal with the laws that are running. So, <clears throat> in my younger years, I was taught the following about propitiation. That it was a blood sacrifice up to God. That we were offering a blood sacrifice to God and God needed blood. God needed blood to forgive sins, which is really Molech, which is really an Old Testament God. Now, it was based on the logic. God is holy and can't look upon sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin needs to be paid for. Jesus has come and paid God for my sin. And he was the perfect sacrifice. And his blood can pay for all of our sins. And when you pile all the sins of the world onto Jesus... God can't look at the sin on Jesus, so he turns his face away. Psalm 22, verse 1, misquote, right? And Jesus' blood pays for our sins, and so God can look at us now in Jesus, and he's a blood sacrifice, and this is called propitiation. Right? That was more or less what I was taught. Anybody? Yeah. Right. It's disgusting. God is holy and can't look on sin. So what we've done is we've cherry-picked scriptures that match with this dualistic worldview. And then we've constructed this thing up and we've ignored the gospel, which is what we've been laying out for the last couple of days. All right? So, God is holy and can't look upon sin. It's a misquote of Habakkuk 1 verse 13. It says... You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You can't look at wickedness. And in the Hebrew, it's really saying, you can't look at this and not do anything. It's saying, the prophet's saying, God, you're too holy to to look, to to see this and not react. And God says in chapter 2, I'll tell you what's going to happen. And it's not a very good chapter. Yeah, along is going to come the Babylonians and this that. But verse 4 of chapter 2 is very interesting because it says one of the things going to happen is the just will live by faith. We, we're going to sort this out from the inside. So, yes. Interesting. It says you cannot look on wickedness. So why do you look on those who you treat Yeah, in other words, why do you look on them and not do anything? Yeah, you can't do it, but you do. Yeah, he, what he's saying is you can't look on it and do nothing and why do you look on it and not do nothing, anything? That's what it means, right? So you go, okay, okay, all right. Sin separates us from God, which is a misquote from Isaiah 59. Your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's not saying God's there. It says you've built a roadblock between yourself and God. You are blind. You are blind, not God. And blindness is not separation. Separation is not possible. But we take these verses and we build them up and then we say, sin needs to be paid for. Hmm. And then we build the logic. There are so many things wrong and illogical about this thoughtlessly well-accepted script, it's hard to know where to start. I, I find it disgusting. But for me, the major one is it splits up the Father and the Son. We've said there is love of, in and between the Father, Son and Spirit and their indivisible union and oneness. Sin cannot split God. We're not that powerful. This, look, this is what we call sin is you're living in the flow and life of God, but you're missing love. It's an incompleteness. It's not very. It's 
And there's no wisdom or understanding or counsel against God. So everything that's evil function in the universe is operating out of the life of Christ. It doesn't have life in itself. It's in the Zoe. It's flowing in the Zoe, but it's blind and it's operating lovelessly and therefore hurting and damaging. This is part of the sufferings of Christ. He's holding this together till it sorts out. Right? So don't tell me that's so powerful that can split this. It can't do it. So there's so many things wrong about it, but it splits up the father and the son. There is loss, rupture of the indivisible union, and therefore Jesus is not God. Woo! It's not orthodox. And it gets weird. Jesus is not the same as the father because apparently Jesus can get down and get dirty in our sin, but dad can't. Hmm. And dad can't even look at it. So they're not the same. Jesus can't just forgive. Jesus says, oh, I can forgive your sin, but the Father needs payment. So the Father and Son are different. And if you've seen Jesus, therefore you haven't seen the Father, which we know Jesus is the exact revelation of Dad. So this is, this is just ripping straight into the heart of the union. And this is what the non-negotiables are. We don't give ground on that. Father, Son and Spirit are one indivisibly one loving each other and yet this method of propitiation which is founded on Greek philosophy and we'll discuss in the coming chat about Christian fish and Greek soup where that's come from but this is Greek philosophy with regard to payment there is no grace if it's payment there's no grace it's payment it's no grace and there's just divine justice in dad who, or the father who demands payment. Hmm. There's no overarching love story. We're lost in morality and payment. What's going to happen if God looks at you outside of Jesus? Your captain's screwed. You're toast. Also, it has tones of child abuse by the father of his son in the name of loving us. There's a paying up to God not a stooping by God. Now look, wow. and despite the work of Christ, you're still required to confess your sins. Well, has it been forgiven or has it not been forgiven? Mm, it's getting complicated now, isn't it? Oh, it gets worse. In addition, we face God in the judgment and our sins stand. What's going on? Has he forgiven sins? Not Have they been paid for? Have they not? Has Jesus removed the sins of the world or not? Hang on. If there's a payment, there's no mercy. If there's no mercy, there's no mercy seat. That's pretty weird. If there's no mercy, there's no propitiation, because propitiation means mercy seat. So their strange logic of mercy seat actually is self-destructive on itself because there's no mercy in it. Totally blows it up. So if we go back to the original non-negotiables, as we're going to go through, at no stage do we violate the love of, in, and between the Father, Son, and Spirit, and the indivisible union one as well. This rips that to pieces. Dad can't look at the Jesus here. Dad turns his face away. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world. When Jesus is hanging there, he's got Dad with him, inside him, and the Spirit around him. And yeah, and sure, as Jesus drops into our darkness, Jesus can't see Dad. As, he, as the bulls of Bashan are ripping at him, as he drops into the dungs, he can't see him, and he cries out to Dad even though he can't see him. And remember, the Spirit shows him the face of Dad, and he gets resurrected. The love that birthed the universe brings him to life. Right? But was Dad there? Yes. Was the Spirit there? Yes. Was Jesus entering our darkness? Yes. Were they still one? Yes. But this thing... This propitiation thing rips them apart and has Dad up here and Jesus down here. Now, the pre-creation purpose. There's nothing in the propitiation thing about sonship or childship. It's locked in morality. There is no love. The father loves the son. The son loves the father. Jesus is bringing the love of the father into our hearts. In this definition of propitiation, there's only morality. This is built within the fallen mind of Adam. This is built within accusing. This is built within the earthly tabernacle and not the heavenly tabernacle. The heavenly tabernacle is about sonship. Where's would gone about ontology? You're called to be a son of God. 
down here is about morality. Now, for us, the eternal son is the one who has done the work coming into us. Now, in this overflowing love, we are made in and by the eternal son and we're held together by him. We don't have life in ourselves. This is not even understood in the propitiation approach. They start with separation. We're starting with union. Now, as we go down, we can point out that Jesus Christ is our understanding of God. No, they reference from, as from sin. And this next point, due to his loving, sustaining union, whatever happens to Jesus as a human happens to us, that's not even understood in that definition of propitiation. They don't even go there. They start from separation. So the first atom for them is stronger than the second atom. Right? So the core of the gospel for us is Father, Son and Spirit are one. They make everything in them. Jesus holds it together. Jesus gives life. Jesus then dives into what he made and what we made. And as he does that, whatever we do to him happens to us. Right? That's the gospel, right? If one died for all, all died, right? Is that applying in this? No. No. There's no union. And what Christ did doesn't happen to us. And there's no forgiveness of sins. We still need forgiveness. And it doesn't deal with the flesh. This entire structure we've been laying out in the gospel mental health is the problem isn't sins. Paul says in Galatians 6 that what you call sins come from the flesh. That's the factory. From the flesh comes, and he lists all the sins. The problem is we've got darkness and flesh in us, and the sins come out the top. The problem is the flesh. The problem is the factory. And that definition of propitiation leaves the factory intact and doesn't allow you to participate with Christ in you. Now, the last thing is the new covenant defines an internal process of Christ in us. And this theory of propitiation, which we've just been looking at, is totally external to you. So we know this definition of propitiation, which we've just laid out, is fundamentally wrong. It's framed in the Mosaic covenant, has little understanding about a heavenly tabernacle or our heavenly calling. Okay. I think that needs to be said, and we've said it. Well, thank you. I think there might, this is a good cue. Walk over to them so the mic picks it up, Bruce. Thank you. Because I've been thinking too, you know, uh, when, Jesus, good. Good. when Jesus said, um, you know, forgive others as I have forgiven you, well, from the separation standpoint, that means that we don't show mercy to people when we <laughs> need blood from them. Is that so right? Good. Right on, wow, bang, is a slam dunk. <laughs> and that's in the so Lord's good. Prayer. <laughs> that's right. Wow. That's great, slam dunk. <laughs> Did it hear for the tape? If you didn't oh, hear yeah, it, it was, it was clear. Okay, good. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. okay, well, I think that's. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. It's cru- I think it's crucial for particularly reaching Muslim. I've um, had an Indonesian guy at church and he would just start to dance when he heard it. Because he's got Muslim friends who say Jesus is a God because of Psalm 22. Now let, let, let me just um, lay out. When we go, we look at Christian fish and Greek soup and look at Muslims, they have an extremely strong structure on this. And the Muslim faith comes from Aristotle, right? And the structure, the theological structures in Islam come from Aristotle. And they are in the So a fundamental, fundamentalist Christian and a fundamentalist Muslim can look the same but the Christian even the dodgy gospel has some concept of forgiveness in it but the for for the Islamics it's very hard on them because there isn't a concept of forgiveness and when they discover Jesus is God and they discover Jesus is God and has forgiven they find freedom yep yep so this this method of propitiation we've just debunked um, is the one in the western world mainly and um, we'll probably get some fundamentalists Um, Christian's putting a fat wire on me after this.